Good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure for me to be here with you to lead off this morning's conversation. I want to talk with you today about a number of elements that come together to create an emerging reality for healthcare in the United States. And that is the growing number of older persons who have multiple chronic conditions and functional impairment. They are not receiving the care that they want or deserve, and their care is extremely expensive and too often unsafe. This is a reality that is ripe for new attention from patient-centered outcomes research. So I want to use this emerging challenge as a foil to illustrate some of the opportunities ahead in patient-centered research. Let's look at the facts of demography. In 1950, just over 8%, or about 13 million Americans, were over age 65. Today, it is more than 14% and 47 million, and by 2050, as you can see, the numbers will have soared to 21% of the population and more than 87 million individuals. That means there will be about four people under age 65 for every one person over age 65. Today in America, already 45 million have at least one chronic condition with functional limitations, and half of those are over 65 years of age. Older citizens with three or more chronic conditions and functional limitations number about six and a half million. There are two parts to the challenge for this population. First, the care these patients receive, in general, is not the care that they want. 71% would like quality of life over interventions for medical conditions. But only 30% of care aligns with the preferences of patients. And the last year of life accounts for 25% of Medicare expenditures. The majority of people with chronic or late-stage illness prefer to stay at home, but only one-third of deaths currently occur at home, and 30% are in an intensive care unit the month preceding death. One quarter of all seniors visit an emergency department at least once each year. Most people want to avoid being a burden to their families. But medical expenses bankrupt one in four seniors, and 42 million unpaid caregivers are working to care for their loved ones with little training or support. The second part of the problem is the cost that these patients entail. With the aging population, with incentives too often to do more rather than provide value, with an emphasis on acute care, with an inclination toward intensive treatments, and with the prospects of repealing the ACA and leaving some millions of patients potentially without insurance, we can see that this is an enormous problem. In fact, the 15% of the Medicare population with six or more medical chronic conditions account for almost half of all Medicare spending. And when these patients go into the hospital, it is not always safe for them. For elders, there are special concerns, including decompensation because of isolation. In fact, some elders never recover from the cognitive decline that they experience in hospitals. They are also more susceptible to infections and one in 25 have an infection that is related to medical care, half of these over age 65. 
Now, behind these statistics, and a wonderful sentiment is that a statistic is a number with a tear attached to it. Let me tell you a story that was reported in the New York Times a couple of years ago at the time that the Institute of Medicine released its report on dying in America. Depicted here on your left is Maureen Stephanides with her late father, Joseph Andre. The story reveals how, through the last year of his life, Mr. Andre was in and out of hospitals, in and out of nursing homes, when he most wanted just to be in his own home. When his daughter struggled to have him come home, she could not find payment, and Medicare and Medicaid would pay for the hospital care, but not for the home care that he needed. He had a number of conditions. He had cancer. He had a stroke. He had urinary tract infection. He had septic ulcers. He had drug-resistant infection. He developed, ultimately, pressure ulcers, delirium, seizures, atrophy, and poor circulation. And ultimately, during the last year of his life, the total cost of his care in places he did not want, with interventions that did him little good, was in excess of $1 million. The article concludes, and I quote, the system was never engineered to support families through this, and its financial incentives reward harmful transition among homes, hospitals, and nursing homes. Now imagine for a moment a different approach that would genuinely put patients first. And what I mean in part by putting patients first is to answer the question, who visits whom? Do caregivers visit the patient or do patients visit the caregiver? When you get to the hospital, who parks closer to the place of the encounter, doctors or patients? Who is most inconvenienced by the hours of practice? Is it the providers or is it the patients? Technology has a special place to play, though it can also be a burden that separates clinicians and patients and a source itself of errors. But virtual visits, home monitoring, and family patient engagement facilitated by technology can all be big pluses. Imagine if care was normally delivered in the home and in the community, not by exception, not outside the standards of payment, but in accordance with what patients actually want and what is best for them, care that is continuous rather than episodic and that genuinely meets their needs. Imagine if this care was accompanied by the kind of social supports that provide the services patients and their caregivers at home most need, including mental health and behavioral support. Imagine if family care caregivers were actually prepared to do the work of caring for their loved ones and supported in that enterprise. Now, that kind of contrast between what we experience and what would be more nearly ideal has many implications for patient-centered research. First, is it possible to identify those community and home-based practices that are exemplary in delivering favorable outcomes and to identify the features that distinguish them? This implies research that engages an even broader set of stakeholders that focuses always on goals and not on medical diagnoses, that incorporates social and financial dimensions along with clinical outcomes, that affects the unit of analysis that we consider the basis of our research, that uses more diverse and inclusive measures, and that is adaptive in its priorities to the new realities. Let me elaborate briefly on some of these. In a very cursory 
examination that identified more than 90 practices of community-based care that we sponsored, about 14 of those 90 in an informal way already incorporated a number of the features that are likely to contribute to favorable care. These are features that include team-based care, family caregiver support, coordination of care, reliance on telehealth as appropriate, and expertise in palliative care. At this point, we don't really know very much about which and how many of those actually contribute to quality and cost, but that is a fundamental challenge for patient-centered research. Engaging a broader set of stakeholders is necessary if we're going to do this work in the communities. First, it's important to remember that all patients are distinct and we need to have a perspective that looks at various subpopulations, such as frail elders, those with particular types of functional limitations, the subgroup that have cognitive limitations. And it is important to consider those individuals with financial and social circumstances that hamper their and their family's ability to deliver and receive the care that is needed. The family caregivers are critical to enabling care in the community. They are part of the workforce for these patients, though they are normally not paid. But they need to be engaged in research as well as in care. They need to have their voices heard in order to identify what the needs really are. And these must encompass also a number of non-clinical professionals in the social and community support areas that contribute more than we can imagine to the well-being of these patients. And finally, we need to incorporate many of the principles of palliative care, which is fundamentally about starting with the goals of the patient more broadly into our thinking about how all patients can be cared for. Focusing on goals rather than diagnoses is a critical part of patient-centered care. Much research in the medical establishment, just think about the NIH for a moment, is organized by disease. This is a convenient way and a traditional way to think about research endeavors, but it is not really how most patients see their lives. Often they are managing multiple conditions. They are seeking ways to integrate their treatment needs with their life goals. How do we shift in both care and research to accommodate these changes? That is a challenge for the research community as well as the clinical community. The social and financial dimensions I have already alluded to. But these dimensions are especially salient when you consider the impact on the lives of these patients with multiple chronic conditions. By and large, the United States, compared to most other advanced economic countries, spends less as a fraction of GDP on social services compared to many other countries. You may be familiar with the work of Elizabeth Bradley and Lauren Taylor in their book, The American Health Paradox, that examines the sum of spending on social as well as health care as a partial explanation for why other countries can often get so much more benefit on standard health outcomes compared to the United States, while the United States is expending so much more on health care itself. Thinking afresh about the unit of analysis means thinking in a more inclusive way about care settings. It's not just about care in a hospital or in a clinic, but care delivered at the home and, in fact, over multiple settings over time. To understand outcomes in this context, 
we need to incorporate this broader definition of the settings in which care will be delivered. And we need to look to new innovations of study design as well as accountability that can take account of the shift in the locus of care over time. We may even need to rethink what we mean by the patient. Are you a patient if you are not currently under active treatment? Patient or person well-being is at the heart of what we need to be focused on. And this means for a population with chronic conditions, the ability to undertake longitudinal studies that will stay with the problem over time that is necessary for outcomes to emerge. The measures that we will use will need to be more diverse and inclusive. We probably will need to go beyond patient reported outcomes to incorporate results from the viewpoints of other caregivers, including, of course, the traditional clinical caregivers, but incorporating also the social supports. And this will entail also an expanded concept of what we mean by outcomes to incorporate many of the non-clinical outcomes that are a part and parcel of the true goals of the patients. Over time, this will imply adaptation of research priorities, focusing, as Wayne Gretzky famously observed, going to where the puck will be rather than where it is, on what the emerging populations of patients will look to be in need. The research community will need to be more nimble in anticipating, measuring, and detecting problems. Imagine for a moment the challenge that emerged with the deinstitutionalization of mentally ill patients and what unexpected and unanticipated difficulties those changes implied. A growing number of patients delivering and receiving care in their communities and homes is likely similarly to entail unanticipated but important shifts. What does all this imply for the key questions before the patient-centered outcomes research community? PCORI itself, like all of US healthcare today, finds itself functioning in a newly uncertain policy environment. For the moment, it is relatively insulated having been authorized for the 10 years from fiscal 2010 through 2019 and supported through that separate trust fund that will underwrite an estimated total of about $3.5 billion of investment. But over the next two years, PCORI will need more than ever to hone in on the highest priorities to provide deeper insights into the relationships between health care and the outcomes that people care about, and to produce out of those studies actionable knowledge from the patient's point of view. To its credit from the outset, PCORI has not only supported research on patient outcomes, but it has always defined its mission and expressed its goals in terms of patients and patient-centered ways. In fact, the vision is not to find results that are good for clinicians or good for payers, but the mission is to have information that patients and the public can use to reflect their desired health outcomes. Nowhere could this be more acutely and specifically addressed than in this emerging population of elders with multiple chronic conditions. The three core questions listed here remain. Are you working on the right topics? Are you working in the right way with the right methods? And are you producing results that actually improve the care and outcomes for patients? Back in 2009, the then Institute of Medicine, now National Academy of Medicine, released a congressionally mandated report on priority topics for comparative effectiveness research. That report was based on more than 20,000 solicitations, a series of public discussions, 
and more than 2,600 suggested topics. The committee honed this list down to 100 priorities organized in four quartiles. According to the GAO assessment released last year, PCORI estimates that about half of the research studies that it funded relates to a, a comparative effectiveness topic that was identified in that report. But 2009 now seems a long time ago. And even then, the highest priorities could well have been debatable. The obligation for the research community, for all of us and for PCORI, is to continue to demonstrate a robust public and expert consultative process to update the research priorities. It's an appropriate debate over how much should be dedicated to specific research topics and how much to improvement in core data systems such as PCORnet, which is a very big bet, a very challenging and a very long-term prospect to make into a productive reality. Operationally, PCORI does have a strong model of stakeholder engagement, and it has the basis to improve and expand on that research. To demonstrate its value, PCORI will be challenged to document where studies that it has supported have produced new insights into preferred care strategies and superior patient outcomes. From a practical point of view, the question is whether this level of evaluation and demonstration can be produced in just the next couple of years. That, in a sense, is the existential challenge for the organization and for all of us who care about success in patient-centered research and ultimately in improving the outcomes of patient care. Fortunately, we can now turn to a panel who will provide the answers. Thank you all very much.